Hi everyone, let's talk about graphic narrative modes. In this third and final section on the subject of modes, we're going to look at sequential modes. Now, a sequence is different from what we've talked about before as a serial narrative in a very important way. In a serial narrative, the various elements of the narrative are usually uniform and indistinguishable for a size or frame or in any remarkable way. Each image is a event or moment in time, and collectively they communicate a single idea. Now, in a sequence, it's a much more complicated relationship between the parts. And the differences in size and character of the various elements changes the way we interpret them. So sequential narratives are really complicated. And they are the way in which the really rich ideas and possibilities of comics can be realized. And then we're going to look at ways in which we can take out the meaning implied in sequential narratives with the non sequitur. Or we can subvert the idea of the narrative by inserting different or conflicting ideas in the text. And lastly, the way the sequence can now be manipulated by the reader in the interactive narrative. So to begin with, we're going to look at the idea of the montage. The montage is a kind of unit of visual experience that we see, typically a page, maybe more, where the way we read the images is related to each other in a very specific visual form. So if we go back to our story of Charlie Brown and his experience with Lucy and the football, we can take the moment where he realizes he's been made a fool of, and we can expand that moment in a sequence, we can create a series of various expressions on the character, but also by changing the frame and the size and character of the frame, or no frame at all, we can create the sense of a growing feeling of doom and despair. Now, Rudolf Topfer is the man who really gets the ball rolling on this idea of the sequential narrative with his very innovative use of panels of various sizes and scenes shifting and changing. In this way, he employs a whole variety of tricks to allow the reader to experience the story in a visual form. Today's comics build on that idea, and we've talked about the way in which the experience of reading it is not just from one unit to another unit to another unit, like a linear narrative, but in fact, the way in which we read a sequential narrative often involves a kind of path, visually linking one action to another and making the story appear to us as we are experiencing it. And of course, the last action is always something that we interpret where the story is going to go next. And this is a very exciting part of the sequential narrative in that it allows for seeing a very tightly linked actions between the panels. One of the ways in which the sequential narrative can be used is not just to build on actions one after another, but to show the absence of actions to repeat something to a degree whereby the lack of change is a marker of the way we're supposed to understand this by repeating this corpse floating down the Imjin River. Harvey Kurtzman is creating this feeling of unremarkableness, the ordinariness of seeing a dead body flowing down the river, and yet that tension that it creates also. Like, where did that body come from? Where is it going? What happened to it? How did it get there? All these things that are lingering in just the visual representation 
of that idea that's being repeated here four times. First large, setting the scene, and then narrowly showing us the overlay of each of those moments again and again and again. Another way in which people have used the sequential narrative is to provide a really innovative kind of experience over time. Uh, the silent strip, in this case, Osama Tezuka, is creating this way in which we see smaller to larger pictures. And he's used the frame in a very imaginative way that sort of encourages us to look at the whole picture as a kind of experience of the moment as we move from the hero Buddha waking up in a cave, realizing he has been captured, and coming to realize his captor is his long-lost friend. Sequences can be enormously complicated and involve a whole variety of different kind of panel relationships. The real master of this early on was Bernard Kriegstein, who really recognized some of the power that was possible in the way that the comic could manipulate our orientation to the action, whether we're seeing the onrush of the car or on the side as the car is sliding past, these different perspectives piling up, the use of larger and smaller frames, each one building on the action uh, before it. There's something very simple about this comic, which I find both elegant and mysterious. A sequence of four images, and we are made to see the moon, the sky, a house, and then a window. And by seeing the window and its four panes of glass, we are reminded that our own comic is in fact a kind of window that is on the other side looking at this scene. So in some ways it is a picture of just looking through a window across the way to see another window. And in other ways it is in fact a sequence. And that tension between being a monoscenic narrative and a sequential narrative is what provides a really innovative possibilities in sequential narratives. Moving on, we can look at the non sequitur. Now, the non sequitur is a comic that suggests the possibility of meaning. Anytime you line up a series of pictures now, we are looking to try and understand what we're looking at. And if the artist deliberately removes meaning from it, we get a feeling of confusion. Uh, disorientation, uh, and frustration. Or maybe it's a kind of hallucinogenic experience where we are suddenly in this imaginary dream world. And so in this way, the non sequitur can play against our expectations of meaning. One of the early examples of this non sequitur narrative was made by the artist Jess Tricky Cad, which was a complex collage of Dick Tracy. And he put together all these various panels and text in such a way that it looks like a comic. But as you go in to read it and begin to make, try and make sense of the picture, more and more the images and ideas kind of pile up and make no sense at all. The language and the arrows and the text are all working against each other. But there is a kind of visual logic to it. And if you look closely, you'll know how the fan blows in the center two panels. The fan blows wind across the center of the page. And then another fan blows in the opposite direction. The ways in which he's visually introducing continuity where there is deliberately none at all. Other artists such as Robert Crumb have played with the idea of abstract comics. 
just to play with the kind of ridiculous and hallucinogenic dream imagery, panels and frames pile up. The text is meaningless. The images grow on smaller and smaller and smaller until they lose all sense or possibility of meaning. Another way that artists have removed meaning from comics is to take a single panel out of context. In this case, Roy Lichtenstein famously found a panel in a romance comic and blew it up large and repainted it in a way that we sense this is a part of a larger comic, but without any reference points, we don't know really how to make sense of it. These kinds of non sequitur comics really make us aware of the conventions of comics and our own expectations of meaning. And that's really the point of pop art, which is to draw us away from meaning making and make us question the way in which we think about narrative constructions. Meta narratives are a strategy whereby the text subverts the picture, the redirection or subversion of meaning. We have an expectation from looking at the pictures that we are seeing one kind of story. But as we enter into reading the text, we are suddenly confused by seeing something completely different. And this tension between our desire for continuity between text and image. And the disparity of that continuity means that the meta narrative makes us aware again of our ability to try and make sense of this. It's calling attention to our expectations of narrative continuity. This was famously explored by the Situationist International Group of Artists who used collage uh, to introduce uh, absurd text and also their own socialist, anarchist ideas uh, into the texts of mainstream pop icons and images. Movie stills, other comics became the source material for their own texts, promoting a disengagement from capitalist society and an attempt to subvert the spectacle of capitalism. A meta narrative does not need text, per se, to call attention to itself. And Saul Steinberg, the artist who worked a great deal with the New Yorker magazine, was a, a fine master of this way in which a drawing. Uh, begins one way and draws us into the, its own making. We begin to see references to the act of its making. And this is a little different than, say, the factura, where we are aware of the materiality of the art. In a sense, it's allowing us to see and create a story about the way in which this art is made. And of course, in this case here, the character in the picture is making their own picture as it kind of closes in on them. Another common way in which the idea of the meta narrative is used is in autobiographical comics, where the artist is telling their own story. And by telling their own story, we are aware of their since making or authoring the story as they're telling it. In this case here, we're seeing the, the tortured confessions of Binky Brown as he encounters his own twisted and disturbed experiences growing up in a Catholic home. And so for this, he is trying very hard to kind of make fun of his that experience, at the same time really representing the painful reality of his tortured psyche. Lastly, we have the interactive narrative. In an interactive narrative, we engage the reader directly in 
choosing the direction of the story. This is a new feature that has appeared in stories. It begins with the introduction of books that provide options for people to move out of a linear narrative experience and begin to really choose where they're going. With computers, these options have, have become more and more commonplace, and this is a, a major form of narrative construction in the way people play video games. The idea of this interaction is that it provides a way for the viewer to come in and feel like they are really the authors of the work, when in fact most of these sort of interactive narratives are very carefully controlled and only give you the illusion of choice. One of the early parodies of this idea of the interactive narrative was Andrew Hussey's Homestuck, one of his many MS Paint adventures. Homestuck was a brilliant and enormously complex game of sorts where the reader is sort of led through a series of options and possibilities, but inevitably uh, the frustration of trying to make sense of this strange digital virtual world that these characters inhabit, where the laws of physics are infinitely mutable by their substacks. So this is the introduction to the sequential narrative. We will review and expand on these ideas in the lectures that come. I'm just trying to introduce the idea and allow you to understand some of the possibilities that we'll be exploring later.